On this week's episode of the podcast, I talked to Alex Clark. She is a conservative podcaster. Her podcast is called Culture Apothecary, but I've never really talked about politics before on my podcast. This isn't meant to be a political podcast. The issue of health and the issue of making America healthy again has become a bipartisan issue, and that is the intent. That's my interest in talking to Alex this week. She recently went to a Senate hearing with Senator Ron Johnson. A number of other really cool people were there, Kelly Means, Casey Means, Jordan Peterson, etc. And there were a lot of really important things talked about at that Senate hearing. Right before this podcast was released, a number of these same individuals, including Alex, went to Michigan and they walked to the Kellogg's headquarters in Battle Creek. Unfortunately, they were met with a cold reception. Kellogg's had no interest in talking to them about the multiple food dyes and additives in cereals like Fruit Loops, which have potentially been linked to harm and behavioral issues in kids. At the end of this podcast with Alex, we talk a little bit about her health journey, and we go into something that I've never really talked about in this podcast, which is what it's like to be a millennial woman dating, and what men who are millennials or Gen Xers or Gen Zers might be looking for in a woman, and maybe how to attract a good quality mate. In today's world, I think one of the biggest challenges we face is attracting a quality partner, either a man or a woman, whose values are aligned with ours. There are a lot of intentional decisions that many of us make with regard to how we choose to live our lives, what we choose to do with our children, how we might want to raise children in the future, how we want to live, where we want to live, what foods we want to eat, and what foods we might want to feed our kids. So these are all things to consider in the health sphere. I think that being healthy is first about ourselves, but then very quickly about who we choose as a partner and how we align those values. So we definitely talked about that with Alex in this episode as well. Please enjoy this podcast with Alex Clark. I will mention that I've been a little bit away from podcasting for a while, focusing on social media and shorter form content, but also was able to podcast with a few other cool folks when I've been here in Los Angeles. So there should be a few awesome podcasts coming in the next few weeks that you can look forward to. Alex Clark, thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me and for this grass-fed beef tallow uh, you just put on your lips. Yes, we'll (laughs) talk about that. So I have a question for you. Did you have a nickname growing up? Because when I saw you in the U.S. Senate, I just thought like that woman is a firecracker. <laughs> like you. what was your, did you have like some sort of nickname like that growing up? Like, yeah, it's really good. This is really going to be ironic. This is a great question. It's very funny. My nickname was Grimace. Okay. Because I lived off chicken nuggets as a kid. Oh my God. And my favorite color was purple. So my dad nicknamed me Grimace from McDonald's. And actually when I I started my media career, I started in radio and they always give the interns, I started as an intern, they give you a nickname. And I told them that. I was like, well, my dad has always called me Grimace. So then they're like, cool, you're intern Grimace. And I was... I was living in Louisville, Kentucky. I was the chicken nugget princess. People knew me around the city as being the girl who was obsessed with chicken nuggets. So me testifying at the Senate, all of this has is the most ironic thing ever for anyone who's known me throughout my life because I never cared about health. And what changed? Why did you start caring about health? I started to find out about the opioid crisis. Okay. Uh, actually, and I was horrified that these three-letter government institutions could tell the American public that different things were safe, that they weren't addictive, that it was totally fine, no side effects. And now we have seen the mass destruction that we have throughout the country because of Oxycontin. And I thought, man, that's interesting. I didn't really know anything about big food, big pharma. I'd never really heard those terms. Uh, We were also going through the pandemic. So this kind of was brought on by Dope Sick on Hulu. So this is very recent. My health transformation is very recent in the last couple of years. I really changed my life. Uh, and I'm watching dope sick and I thought, well, are there any other drugs? Or is there any other things that, you know, we've kind of been lied to as consumers and that led me to hormonal birth control. And I was somebody who had been put on that at 15 for, I don't, I couldn't tell you why. No reason. I think it was just like, do your cramps hurt? Yeah. Oh, well, you know, what can really fix that is hormonal birth control. And so I was on that for over a decade. Thankfully, before my health transformation, that was something I already had an intuition of, I should get off this. I don't know that this is really serving me any purpose. So I had gotten off of it uh, a couple years before all this big transformation, but I didn't understand how bad it was for women. And uh, then I found big food. And ever since I've just been like, it's like, a, it's been like a fire hose. Like I, I'm just trying to get all this information and learn as much as I can. And I've been taking my audience along with me. So what was it like being in the Senate with that Senator 
It was an incredible collection of people. And I'm so glad this has happened and that RFK Jr. is kind of driving this. He's the catalyst. Like, what's the sentiment in Washington? And if people haven't watched this 10 minute clip on your YouTube channel, I would encourage them to go watch it because what you said was incredible. And I want to talk about that too. But what's the sentiment? Like, what's going on in Washington? Do you think there's a chance at this election we're going to actually see some sort of reform, bipartisan reform of the healthcare system? That would be incredible. Okay. Senator Ron Johnson gets all of these like huge people in the health space together to have this panel on food and pharma corruption, metabolic disease, chronic disease. And <laughs> Callie Means texts me and says, you know, would you want to be a part of this? And I said, no, I said, absolutely not. I am not, I don't have any business being on there. And I literally said to him, I said, Callie, I am not like all these people are like stand for medical doctors, Harvard doctors, we, like, you know, very credentialed people or hardcore food activists that have been doing this for decades, like the food babe, Vani Hari. I was like, I am totally the person that is like the odd one out here. I'm just a podcaster. And he said, yes. But here's the thing, Alex, you are so in tune with millennial women. Think about it. You guys are the ones that were experimented on with processed food, with the vaccine schedule exploding. You guys are now the ones who are experiencing infertility. You're, you're, you're experiencing all of these huge hoops that you have to jump through raising healthy kids in America. It's nearly impossible. Um, all the different things that your audience complains to you about, like you need to be their voice. Basically, you're going to be the one to just be the voice of the American people. Whereas everybody else is like, I'm an expert. Here's what we should do about this. Here's what we should do about this. And so I thought about it and I was like, okay, that's what I'm gonna do. Because the other thing is, is I'm not a mom yet. So I know what I know from all my best friends who have kids now, from my audience who has kids now and what they're experiencing. And so I just tried to put together every message, every DM that I get every day and put that in a 10 minute speech and try my very hardest to have that mama bear energy and that anger and really draw attention to the emotional distress that American women are experiencing today, trying their hardest to raise children in such a sick culture. Can you summarize it for us and like, like <sighs> rekindle it, channel it, Alex, show me, because it's an incredible 10 minute speech, but in 45 seconds, like, or a minute, like what is the sentiment that you're seeing from your millennial women audience at this point? The sentiment is, we were the guinea pigs and we never gave informed consent as millennial women. You skyrocketed the vaccine schedule with us. You introduced us to GMOs. Ultra processed food was completely compromised. Uh, seed oils, we were told that fat was bad, that everything had to be low fat. Um, the, the food pyramid that we grew up with in school, every single piece of information that we were given about health and food was completely corrupt. It was bought and paid for. We were all told to be put on hormonal birth control for absolutely no reason. Um, and now we're growing up, we're in our late 20s, we're in our early to mid 30s, and we are having trouble having children. Why is that? We want to see somebody held responsible. Why is nobody being held responsible? And we are trying to raise kids to the best of our ability in a system that is completely rigged. So for those of us who at least have our eyes open and we want to make better decisions, we don't know where to go for information. So when I am pulling up, you know, our GMOs bad, I'm like digging through pages and pages and pages and pages of Google to try to find one alternative opinion. It's completely buried. So my audience is so confused and I was telling you, on, on my interview with you on my show is that they're just now throwing out their nonstick pans. They're like, they're throwing anything at the wall to see what sticks, trying to get a grip and get ahead and get their head above water um, in, in what you call this toxic soup that we've been living in. And so it's unfair. And I think, you know, I'm a, I'm a conservative. And what was interesting about this panel is that Senator Ron Johnson, who is a conservative, was hosting it and he brought RFK Jr., who's not a conservative, um, and, and all these different people from different walks of life together. And it was a totally nonpartisan panel. There were some people on there that were Democrats. There were some people who were Republicans. It, none of that mattered. None of it even got brought up. I have no idea what everyone was. We weren't you know, talking about it behind the scenes. The point was, who is willing to have this discussion? Who's willing to get together? Um, and you know, historically, conservatives, our position has always been, it's personal responsibility. It's up to the person. If, if they want to eat junk, if, they're, if they want to eat healthy, good, that's their choice. And my point and what I've been trying trying to talk about on my show is that you can't ask people to have, uh, to take personal responsibility and make healthier decisions when the entire system is rigged. And everything is, is kind of leveraged against us, whether it's marketing, whether it's Google searches, 
you know, what big, big tech. Um, I, I, one of my friends and I were talking about this recently. One of my guests on my podcast is that remember during the pandemic talking about getting sunlight was shadow banned. That was shadow banned. So don't tell us that we need to take more personal responsibility and make better decisions right. when you're blocking information on freaking sunlight. It's insane. Most of my audience knows that I got canceled during the pandemic. So my, Did you? my Instagram was deleted in November of 2021. And I had to restart. Man, you built back. We had to restart from zero. I guess people find it valuable. Yeah. So in November of 2021, got deleted. My literary agents were just wringing their hands and they were like, why do you keep talking about this? And I just couldn't stop talking about it. But the pandemic is just a crazy example of really, really insane thinking gone awry and intuition out the window and common sense out the window. I was living in San Diego at the time. They closed the beaches. They closed the hiking trails. Oh my gosh. Remember in California when they were bringing those dump trucks to- um, Skate parks. Yes, to the skate parks. And I thought that was so dystopian. I remember seeing that. I was so unsettled. And then we were you know, all being told, hey, uh, immediately we all need to inject ourselves with this certain thing. Um, you know, There's been no time really to look into this, but like just trust us. And so that was the thing too. It was like Dope Sick came out on Hulu. Like Everybody's watching that. And then also this- you know, you have to take this, you, you have to do this medical intervention in order to participate in society. I thought there's something wrong with this. And so, yeah, it was all these things happening at once that really opened my eyes. And I think a lot for a lot of conservatives, that was the case. We did not conservatives are the last group. The stereotypes are absolutely true. It's, it's protecting our Big Macs, our, our extra large, you know, uh, fun, um, uh, super size meals. I remember growing up and my parents having Fox News on and seeing them talk about like taxing soda in New York City. And you had all of these conservative commentators on Fox News being like, this is an attack on freedom. And, and it couldn't, that couldn't be more wrong. But, but here's the good thing is that, you know, I am not trying to pretend as a conservative health and wellness podcaster that conservatives have been the ones, you know, from the get-go who have cared about this or been right about right. this. We are last. The left, or I should say like crunchy granola hippie liberals, <laughs> they were right. It was Californians who were, who were really drinking raw milk and, and, and doing all this, you know. That was not, um, that wasn't Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, so that is important to know and give credit where credit is due. Uh, also, when it comes to hormonal birth control, it wasn't conservative women who were speaking out on hormonal birth control. In the early 1970s, it was the liberal feminists who were, who, who were showing up at, um, uh, on, on the Hill and saying, you guys are experimenting on women. We've had enough. You're not telling the truth. And they were standing up to them and they were kicked out of the of, of the hearing. So that wasn't conservatives. That wasn't, you know, these anti-women Trumpers who were saying like, we don't like birth control. No, it was historically liberals who really cared about this stuff. And now I think it's great that conservatives are now coming around and that we're saying like, okay, you guys were right. Like we're willing to meet you, meet you in the middle on this. But uh, NBC News, um, Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, uh, that isn't the case for them. Now all of a sudden it's extremism that I am talking about raw milk. What happened? It's, it's, isn't it interesting that you're saying, and I, I don't consider myself to be a political podcaster. My audience would laugh at this. I'm a health podcaster. Yeah, exactly. Right, And it's not a partisan issue. You're saying the conservatives are saying to the, the liberals or the, the right is saying to the left, you were right. Yes. Let's meet in the middle. And what is happening? And now they're the like, you guys are crazy. You guys are extremists. Uh, uh, I mean, they're literally saying things like exercise and stuff is, is extremism. Right-wing extremism is so what are it's seed being oils. called. Seed oil yeah. hating is right-wing extremism now. Explain it to me. What happened? Yeah. I mean, what, was there any, in your experience, because you're much more in this world of like the politics and the Hill and stuff when you went with the senator and all these people to, to the U.S. Uh, Capitol, like, is the left participating in this at all? Are they coming across the aisle? Like, is there any discussion? Can we hope that any of these leftist liberal leaning people are going to be a part of this? Or is it really just the conservative stuff, people driving this now? Well, I mean, you saw RFK Jr. coming out and endorsing Trump. That man, they are doing everything possible to ruin his life because RFK of this. Jr. or Trump? RFK well, Jr. Both, yeah. both. Both. Really? Trump, Trump is, that's been, we already yeah. know that. Yeah. But I mean, they've tried to kill him twice. But the the point is with RFK Jr., he has risked everything, his marriage. I mean, that was the, the thing for the longest time. He didn't want to endorse Trump. I mean, he said like, I don't know that my marriage will last. Cheryl did not want him endorsing Trump. But when Trump came to him and said, look, first he wanted him to be VP. RFK Jr. said no. 
Then he said, okay, health czar, like be in charge of all the health stuff. I'll give you the power immediately while we're campaigning to start putting the transition team together. We have over 5,000 people now. RFK Jr. is handpicking that's going to help on this. This is nonpartisan. These people are not all Republican conservatives, okay? This is just people that care about health and holding food and pharma accountable where they should be. So well said. that is incredible and it's already in the works. Um, and so, yes, are, are people on the, on the left having their eyes open? Yeah. I mean, RFK Jr. is one of those people. And so to me, when I see somebody like that say, okay, here, here's what I think is interesting. This is something that RFK Jr. has been fighting for his entire life, right? He easily could have said, no, no, I want nothing to do with Trump. I want nothing to do with the Republican Party. Um, I don't care. Like, this is where this stops. And my activism, my advocacy, like, it stops here. The cause is so important to him that he said, I'm going to compromise on this and I'm going to band together with these people right. who I don't agree with on everything to get this mission done. Whereas I see people, and I will call out Senator Cory Booker. Why is Cory Booker, who has been advocating for real food for years, refusing to endorse Trump? Why is he not saying, look, I absolutely can't stand Trump. I hate everything else. But if this is who's willing to get this done, this supposed mission that I have cared about for how many years that I've been saying we need this, we need to get you know organic food to more children, not Ozempic, why would you not put that aside to work on this? So then I think, who actually cares about this? If you cannot ban with people who you were told allegedly were the bad guys, if they're willing to to um, you know work towards the same mission as you, then how important is that mission to you? It's crazy. And it's just, I don't know, like what a crazy time, you know, that, that we can't all just agree that like health is paramount. Like, why are we not prioritizing this? Why does it have to even be a political issue? It's just, it's an insane thing to me. When, when, when you, okay. America right now is the Titanic. We are sinking. Um, you are not going to be asking each person, we should not be asking each person drowning in the ocean, are you a Republican or Democrat before right. we hand you a life jacket or send a life raft to you, right? Um, right now, health in America, we, we are the sinking Titanic and it doesn't matter who you are, we just need a life vest. And if Trump and RFK are the people who are willing to hand that out, are you gonna take it or are you going to drown? That is where we're at. I really, I totally agree with you. And I think that RFK Jr. and so many of the people at this Senate sort of hearing or Senate community talk, we're talking about this, like, I believe that this health crisis will bankrupt our country. This will destroy our country. You know, you can look mm -hmm. at China and say, okay, their one child policy really has changed their population. Oh my gosh, yes. There are not enough males in the population, or there are not enough females in the population. They can't, their population is collapsing. I believe our country will implode in debt from our health crisis because everything is going in the wrong direction. You've seen this now. When you had your eyes opened and you've fallen down this rabbit hole, we see obesity rates we see going up in kids, in adults, diabetes, cancers, heart disease, everything. We see fertility rates going down. Like our country, the Titanic is a really well said analogy because it is so true. We are going to be destroyed. We are going to destroy ourselves. Yeah, we're spending inside. more on um, healthcare in this country than anything else. So that tells you, and, and think about this, how many of us are on multiple prescription medications? We're, we're, more, we're more medicalized than we've ever been in American history, right? But we're not getting better. We're getting sicker. This is what's crazy. So something is not adding up and we're spending more and more money on healthcare. Imagine if if we could take some of that money and we could do more organic foods in schools, uh, different things like that, how, how transformative that would be for the future of America. So it's not even just looking at things like what's gonna change for us right now living, but I mean, this ticket, what, what this could do for health in America, we will see this trickle for generations. This, this would culturally, change America forever if we are able to do this. And and we'll never get this opportunity again. There will never be somebody like RFK Jr. again who's willing to do all this and risk everything. Not in our lifetimes, no. certainly. Hopefully, who knows, at some point, but not within what you and I will see on this planet. And then I've heard RFK Jr. talk about this Ozempic bill. Have you heard about this? This bill that's in the yes. Senate. And if this passes, it will, to the tune of trillions of dollars, I think it's $3 trillion, burden the U.S. debt paying for Ozempic for people on Medicare and Medicaid. And he had such an interesting thing where he said, like that $3 trillion could feed every family in America with organic food. Mm -hmm. And yet you're not looking at the root cause of the problem. And when it comes to conservative and liberal ideologies, I'm still salty about the Instagram cancellation because it wasn't the freaking conservatives that canceled me. Right. It was a liberal driven social media 
cadre, and this has come out now in the Justice Department with Meta, even Twitter. You know, I wasn't canceled on Twitter. You know, thankfully, Jack Dorsey had some sense, but... Well, um, also, I just want to point out, we now know for certain, because Mark Zuckerberg admitted it, that it was the Biden-Harris administration who was telling him lists of who to censor and saying, can you please do something about this page? Isn't that crazy? That is unconstitutional. It's, it's, yeah, it's just... It's insane. So we've got lots of issues this election. We've got uh, the the issue of health. We've got the issue of free speech. And uh, those all two, up for grabs. Yeah, they're so those two are so close to my heart, regardless of political leaning. And how are people supposed to find the health information if we're not allowed to talk about it? And we're not allowed to talk about it, Alex, because asking questions is censored now. Yeah, right? forbidden. Yeah, I mean, I did a podcast on Nicole Shanahan's podcast that was RFK Jr.'s vice president for a while, and we talked about all of these ways that I've been censored. So. I mean, on YouTube, I had videos on breastfeeding removed. I've had videos on raw milk removed. I had a video talking to a guy at a farm in California, the largest producer of raw milk in the world. They have over a thousand cattle at raw farm in California. We went there. I saw the farm. I saw how they, were, how they were intentionally doing things to make it cleaner. And that video talking to him about the practices was removed from YouTube. It's just, it's crazy to me. We can't talk about these things. Oh, so so where are we? But Kellogg's is an interesting one. So one of the most striking things I saw at this Senate hearing was a box or a bag of Fruit Loops in the United States and Fruit Loops from Canada and the food dives. Then in the United States, we allow Red 40, Yellow 5, Yellow 6, Blue 1. And in Canada, those are illegal. And so the difference between American Fruit Loops and Canadian Fruit Loops is striking in terms of how it's going to affect a kid's brain and how much more addictive it's going to be because it's so much more colorful, hearkening back to the fruit from our evolutionary history. You guys are doing a protest at Kellogg's, right? Yes. Yeah, the time we're recording this, we're a couple mm. days away from our Kellogg's protest. We have over a thousand people that have RSVP to show up. So hopefully they do and they bring bring even more. Um, and we're going to middle of nowhere, Battle Creek, Michigan, to walk from a park, march from a park to Kellogg's headquarters. Uh, not only do, will we have uh, around a thousand people marching, God willing more, but, and this is, you know, all walks of life, moms, their kids, just Americans who are tired of our food being poisoned. And we're going to walk up and hand Kellogg's a petition with over 200,000 signatures from American moms demanding that they remove BHT and artificial dyes from their cereal. Now, Hear me on this because I'm getting a lot of these messages and I'm like, you guys are missing the point <laughs> right? because they're like, Alex, who cares if they miss, like take all that stuff out? Like you still think you think people should eat Fruit Loops then? I'm like, no. But the point is you are going to have people uh, that really do not know, um, you know, any of this type of health information that we do. They don't have access to it or whatever. And, and they're going to eat the Fruit Loops anyway, okay? So shouldn't we just make it a little bit better for American kids? Uh, can we just can we all just agree that bare minimum, American kids deserve uh, the better quality that Kellogg's, by the way, is willing to give uh, kids all around the world? So what's really sick about Kellogg's is that in America, they are making one batch that uses paprika and all these very like turmeric. natural, yet yeah, turmeric, <laughs> things like that to color their cereal. And they are shipping that out to every other country. And then also in America, they are making their toxic sludge cereal for American children. And when we ask them at first, you know, why won't you make these changes? Kellogg's response to uh, the food babe, Vani Hari was, well, uh, your, your American children like this. They prefer it. And so Jason Karp, who is the founder of um, uh, Hugh Chocolate, he was speaking on the Senate pa panel, and his point was, sure, of course American kids are going to prefer uh, these Fruit Loops to these Fruit Loops, just like they would prefer cocaine to sugar. Of course. So, so the point is, is that the adults in the room are supposed to be caring for those kids who are not capable of understanding what BHT and, and artificial colors can do to their brain and their bodies. We need to be the people to be standing up for them. Um, and so the least we can do is remove these ingredients, especially if you're already doing it everywhere else. It's not hard for them to do. Junk food is a Pandora's box for children. You can't open the Pandora's box of Skittles, Fruit Loops, tricks and a million other things and expect a kid to make a good decision. The dopamine systems in their brain are just not well developed. We, we have no, you just don't have enough consciousness and self-reflection to make those decisions until we're later in life. And so that's crazy that Kellogg's wants to justify it with that, with that adage that, oh, kids prefer it. Well, no shit they prefer it. They'd probably like it more if you put some actual cocaine in there or, yeah. you know, a hard drug. And what's really cool is that 
we have had Ellen DeGeneres uh, speak out against Kellogg's now. Wow. We've had all three Kardashian sisters, Kim, Chloe, and Courtney, have all posted in mm. the last uh, couple days. That's incredible. Calling out Kellogg's, saying, Kellogg's, what's going on here? Why won't you do something? And Kellogg's has been completely silent. So they have, we've been like, hey, you know, um, before we show up there, are you willing to, to make any announcements? Nothing? No. Absolute silence. So what is their plan? We don't know. But we're going to go. We're going to show up. That's so interesting. Do you know the story of cornflakes? No. So Kellogg's cornflakes were developed in 1896 in Battle Creek, Michigan at the Battle Creek Sanitarium. So in the late 1800s, psychiatric patients were sent to a sanitarium. This was a psychiatric institution. And John Harvey Kellogg was involved in this. And the reason they were developed was to um, decrease the male libido. <gasps> To decrease oh the masturbation yes I do know this the cal the the cornflake masturbation link yes yes <laughs> of course yes so this is crazy this is an act this is real American history that cornflakes were developed by John Harvey Kellogg to essentially be so nutrient depleted that you have less carnal desire that you don't have as much of a libido oh and you God. don't masturbate so what happens to both men and women when they eat meat we have a libido a healthy sexual drive, right? Because of the unique nutrients in meat. But if you give someone cardboard, obviously the essential equivalent of cardboard with a cornflake, you deplete them of nutrients and it helps quell the libido. This is all connected with seven day Adventist sort of religious mm -hmm. dogma, but that is the original story of cornflakes. And I've told that story on social media and the post got taken down as misinformation. Yeah, actual real history. It's they cool. do not want you to know no. that the cornflakes are meant to prevent <laughs> masturbation. So say that when you go, you know, like, Okay, I'll say that again. Oh my gosh, I should say that with my little bullhorn at Kellogg's. <laughs> Did you know they don't want you to, to masturbate? No. They want you to eat cornflakes and not be have any sex, you know, like they're anti-sex. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it's, that's hilarious. I forgot that. I'm going to have to tell that at a dinner. We're doing like a, a dinner the night before all of the, like the health people that are going and I'm going to bring this up. It's so crazy. So thank you for that work you're doing. Thank I'm you. super excited about that. Now you've had your own health issues. You told me at the beginning of the podcast, your nickname was Grimace. <laughs> like, and so what has happened in your own life? You said you were on birth control. You got off birth control. Have your health issues affected your food choices and are there health issues now you're trying to fix? Yeah. So, um, my health is, we are just a work in progress. Like we're really just getting started because I just found out in the beginning of this year that I have Hashimoto's. Mm -hmm. So my thyroid is basically attacking itself. Um, and we're trying to figure out here what to do. I also, one thing is with all of this going on, I mean, my estrogen and my progesterone are like zero. Mm -hmm. So when I did, I did a Dutch test in January. I did a Dutch test in July, um, which was my most recent one. And it's like my progesterone and my estrogen are getting lower and lower, which is interesting to mm -hmm. me. So the, what I'm chalking it up to is like, okay, I am really busy with the work that I do, like constantly filming, tra there, all, traveling. There. And so I think one thing, because when I was Googling this, the thing that kept coming up was eating disorder. You see this in eating disorders. Right. So I was like, I don't have an eating disorder. Like I love to eat. I just think, I was like, okay, maybe I need to be uh, holding myself more accountable and I need to really make sure that I'm making time and I'm eating a lot. Maybe I need to up my protein even more. So I'd love to hear what you think about what I should be doing. I'll pause the podcast for just one second to tell you about Lineage Provisions. I'm super proud of this company, guys. I recently founded it with my buddy, Anthony Gustin. You may have seen our grass-fed, grass-finished beef sticks. These are awesome. They're the best beef sticks on the market. They're air-dried, grass-fed beef, grass-fed liver, grass-fed heart, salt, vinegar and a collagen casing. That is all that you will find in these. There's no nitrates, there's no preservatives, they're air dried. These are the best beef sticks on the market and they're sourced from the most incredible cows in Southern Australia. We also make a grass fed, grass finished beef tallow. I recently got an analysis of this beef tallow back. It has the lowest amount of linoleic, la it has the lowest amount of linoleic acid the lab has ever seen. This is the best beef tallow in the world at Lineage Provisions. And in case you didn't know, we recently released a creatine supplement. I take creatine every single day because often I don't get more than two pounds of meat per day. And we know that optimizing your creatine stores helps with recovery, helps with mental clarity. It helps with explosive power in your muscles. So many benefits to creatine. And we make a very, very pure creatine, 99.99% .99 pure, tested for impurities. And we added a little bit of sea salt to help with absorption. So check us out at lineageprovisions.com. We're gonna keep making awesome food and animal-based products. Stay tuned. We've got a new drop coming at the end of October. So stay tuned for that as well. lineageprovisions.com. 
eat like a human. How's your sleep? Oh, so sleep is something, my, my crew, they're all shaking their head. Um, so the last thing that I have not gotten rid of in this journey all right. is Ambien. Okay, wow. I, it is really, really hard for me to stop taking Ambien. Um, and I wonder how, what is being affected. So when I Google side effects of Ambien, it's basically nothing. When I ask my doctor, or everything. regular primary care doctor, it's nothing. What's hard for me about getting rid of it is, one, the reason I take it in the first place is because I was in morning radio for almost a decade of my career. So before I was doing podcasting, before I was doing any of this, I was waking up at 4 a.m. to go to work uh, and be on the air by 6 a.m. And so it was really hard for me to get my body to fall asleep at like, you know, dinner time when mm -hmm. the light is still out. It just was, that's not natural to, to work and live like that. So, right. so I tried everything. I was oh doing melatonin, God. I was doing all this. And then the doctor was like, You're, you've got to try Ambien. So I get on Ambien and this is like over seven years ago. So now my body is completely addicted to it. I do not know how to sleep without it. If I if I miss a day, like I forget to fill my prescription, I'm going. I basically go through withdrawals at night. Like I'm shaking, like I can't sleep. It's horrible. It's it's horrible. And so the so yeah, the sleep. I'm dealing with that. Oh, and what I was going to say is that the other thing is like with the work I'm doing, I'm traveling all the time. I'm in different time zones. It's so it's it's so it's so crazy and erratic, and so it's hard for me to just. When am I supposed to wean off of it? So so this is my biggest issue that now you you have all of my problems out. My audience, that's another thing is that they always ask me like, have you ditched the Ambien yet? Because I'm honest with them and I and I tell them that. But no, and I'm like, oh my gosh, am I gonna should I go to rehab to like withdraw? Should. You really think I need to go to rehab? I think you need to go to Ambien rehab. And I'll tell you this. So Ambien is one of these sedative hypnotics that's a non-benzodiazepine. So Jordan Peterson had an addiction to benzodiazepines. He's been very open about this. Mm -hmm. And he had to go to rehab in like Russia to detox and he almost died. But what these medications do, and alcohol has a benzodiazepine-like effect as well. They make you sleep, but they change your sleep architecture. It's fake sleep, just like birth control is a fake period. It's completely fake sleep. Oh my gosh. So your body is not cycling the same sleep architecture that you would off of Ambien. So even when I'm wearing my aura ring and Nina is telling me like you've your your REM is like incredible no, and all that, it doesn't fake. matter. It's, <gasps> fake. it's totally fake because then you don't have an EEG on your head, right? So the, your aura ring is looking at your maybe some of the other metrics, maybe your heart rate variability or your pulse or your how much you're moving. I don't believe it. If you put an EEG, which is, you know, the all the electrodes on your head and you did a real sleep study, I bet your REM would be off because these medications do this. They disrupt, disrupt sleep architecture. Cannabis does this. Alcohol does this. Benzodiazepines, so Xanax, Valium do this, and Ambien, Lunesta, all of these medications do this. They're fake Okay, but I just feel like I never hear that. I know I hear people saying I'm going to rehab for Lunesta or Ambien. So am I going to just be like a weirdo? No, I think it's actually the way to do it. Okay, so how long do you think it would be in there? Like two weeks or I gotta be like- I mean, it's gonna be tricky. You'd have to find the right place. You know, oh you might be able to do it off of, um, you might not have to go to rehab because like to my knowledge as a physician who's not a sleep specialist at this moment, there is no life-threatening withdrawal from Ambien, mm -hmm. right? It is not a benzodiazepine. However, it's possible that you could have some pretty serious withdrawals. So a benzodiazepine, just like alcohol withdrawal, you have to go to rehab or you could die. You can have seizures and other issues. It's possible Ambien is that severe, but you might also be able to do it outside of rehab. But like you said, we're talking about probably two to three weeks of suffering, oh like my pretty serious suffering. And so you might want to have some medical intervention. There. Like that's going to be hard. On the, on the other side of that, I believe you could sleep. You certainly now can have a more regular circadian rhythm. So I think you can do it. You don't have to go to sleep at 6 p.m. anymore. Even so you like, think that's what's affecting my progesterone and estrogen? I think it's a major possibility, <gasps> yeah. Nobody has told me this yet. Well, sleep is foundational. I mean, I, you know, I didn't even ask you about your diet first, right? Because I, I know your diet's getting better, but diet is huge too. Stress will affect it, right? I think my diet is basically perfect. That's the one thing I have a hold on uh -huh. is is definitely the diet aspect. Zero ultra processed food. That's great. Um, so uh, and and you know I, I, I'm trying really hard to eat mostly meat. Um, no chicken nuggets anymore. No chicken nuggets anymore, um, unless they're homemade. So yeah, I, I feel like the diet part is what I'm I'm good at. You're dialed, yeah. So, but other, I don't, the sleep obviously is a problem. And then, um, so one controversial thing about me is I don't work out. Why not? I hate it. <laughs> and I, and I think it has to do with the Hashimoto's. Oh yeah. yeah I okay. feel worse when I work out. Mm -hmm. I am so tired. 
um, and it's really, really rough on me. So, so my thing is like, I have to get this thyroid thing figured out so that I can start working yes. out. Um, so that's like a whole mess. I think you've got that prioritized properly. Like if you feel worse when you wake out, work out with the Hashimoto's, I don't think you should force that. I've often said in my social media and my educational content that food should come first mm -hmm. and then the exercise should follow. I feel like other people in the space want to just prioritize exercise over food and they'll say, there's so much confusion in nutrition studies. Don't worry about what you eat. Just go get your zone two cardio. And I disagree with that because I think most people until they start with sleep and food quality aren't going to have the motivation to work out. And if you correct sleep and you correct food quality, you will have so much energy that you will want to move. You'll want to work out. You should want to work out. And that I think is the key. If you are just forcing yourself to work out, your body's giving you a pretty key signal there. So I don't think the lack of exercise is the problem. I think it's probably a lot of stress in what you're doing. Maybe go, go, go. Maybe hypo yeah. calories. You might not be eating enough. I wonder how many calories you're getting in a day. Have you ever put your daily food into something like Chronometer? No. That's worth doing. It's free. So is it an app? Yeah, it's just online. It's C-R-O-N-O-M-E-T-E-R. -E um, and you can just put all of your food into it. It's not perfect for micronutrients, but if you put a day of eating, you'll see calories, you'll see macros, so fat, protein, carbohydrates, you'll see breakdown of amino acids, you'll see micronutrients, and it just gives you a sense if you're massively deficient in something or if you're under eating. You know, if you're, for, for instance, maybe you're only eating 950 calories a day and you're thinking like, oh, actually, I probably should eat a few more calories than that. So okay. that, that could be an issue too. Nobody's told me this. This is like a come to Jesus moment. This is my intervention. <laughs> you didn't even know it was happening, right? <laughs> I didn't know this was happening. <laughs> but yeah, I think that the Ambien is the place to start for you with that stuff. Okay. I yeah. did. I weaned myself off Lexapro. That was another thing that uh, I was put on for absolutely no reason. I don't struggle with anxiety and depression. I, it was just work. I've just been stressed out from work. Um, and so they were like, here, take this. And this was a couple years ago. And so anyway, I weaned off that last year. How was that? I did great with that. Because that can be hard for people to get off to. I cut it I cut it up, you know, and I just did smaller sections. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I probably need to do something kind of similar with the Ambien. You might have to do something like that with the Ambien. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But isn't this an illustration of what we were talking about? Western medicine just handing out, quote unquote, candy with no real regard for the long-term side effects or ramifications of these things, whether it's birth control, whether it's SSRIs, SNRIs, whatever, and sleep medications. I mean, a lot. I think the sleep medications are probably the most sinister. They just lock people in. Yeah, and my whole, that's my whole thing is, is you know, I'm not a health and wellness podcaster because I, like, coming from an expert's perspective, like, you are an expert. I'm just the question asker, and I'm learning along my, alongside my audience. And so, like, as I'm going through these things, changing my food, you know, weaning off of Ambien, and all these, like, my audience is, is going through similar things. And so um, that's been fun because it's kind of like a built-in family and support system it's to great. have that. And we're kind of all navigating this together. Together. Now, you were telling me before the podcast about your family. Are you willing to talk about yeah. your dad's health a little yep. bit? Because I think this is similarly illustrative. So it sounds like you grew up in a family that had a lot of processed foods. We did. And I will say this to give my mom credit, because she gets really bent out of shape when I talk about <laughs> this. We did have a lot of ultra processed food. This is the problem, is you don't realize how much you're eating sometimes, even with home cooked meals every night. How much is, uh, you know, this gravy packet here or whatever, like just all, it's seed oils and, and, and corn syrup, or whatever is hidden in so many things. Right. So my mom was really great about cooking every meal homemade. We were, we rarely went out to eat besides like, you know, the, the McDonald's runs or whatever, uh, occasionally, which was always exciting. I remember my fifth birthday was at McDonald's. Um, I, I got to sit in the throne and I have the little crown on and everything. And I think my Sinister. scrapbook from then, like being five years old, my mom wrote chicken nugget princess in there. So besides that though she did make everything homemade so so to her she's like well we were healthy because i was making everything but it's these individual ingredients going into the meals that can like really wreak havoc yeah. when i and i was also a very very picky eater there's a lot of foods that i don't like and so in high school when it was lunchtime, I remember being the person who would go through the line and I would get like six Rice Krispie treats and a fruit punch, like a Tahitian treat, Hawaiian punch. And that's what I would eat. Um, and so I was doing that every single day. And then I was put on birth control. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, that's kind of the, the story of my family and my, and my dad also very picky and primarily living off ultra processed foods. We loved goldfish crackers in my house. We loved Oreos and, and, and Ritz bits with cheese and 
Pringles. I mean, that's that's what it was. Um, my dad loved White Castle. Every time we'd pass White Castle, we'd have to stop and get a little little square slider. Um, and so my dad now, uh, he's only 56. He has type 2 diabetes. He's survived two heart attacks. Oh His God. heart is only working 10% on one side. Okay. And he really needs a heart transplant. But Nobody wants to give him a heart transplant because he also now has glioblastoma. Uh, so he had a tumor removed uh, in January of this year. Which is a brain tumor. Yep. And uh, so, so far, all his MRIs, nothing has come back. Okay. But what is extremely frustrating is so I'm doing this podcast and I'm interviewing amazing people like you. I mean, I have access to some of the greatest minds in health and wellness in the world that, you know, I'm talking to. And, um, you know, one of these people that I've interviewed was Dr. Keneally, uh, one of the top holistic cancer doctors in the United States. She practices in Irvine, California. So I asked her, like, what would you recommend my dad diet wise do? She said, he's got to be on a keto diet. Okay. So this was her recommendation. So I tell my dad this, my dad brings this and my parents live in, in the Midwest. He's going to, he, and they refuse. I have begged. I've been like, please, let's go see some uh, different, you know, let's talk to some different alternative doctors. Nope. They want to do the standard oncologist. So he goes to the hospital and he talks to the oncologist and he talks to, uh, or the neurosurgeon, I guess I should say. And he talks to uh, the nutritionist that they provide him at the, at the hospital. And he tells them, my daughter is saying I should be on a keto diet for the brain cancer. And they say, oh, absolutely not. Um, definitely not. You don't want to be high fat diet uh, with your heart. That wouldn't be good. And I said, dad, this is the problem. I said, these people, the, I said, the, the nutrition school that he went to probably told him all of that. I said, but dad, do you understand who's funding the nutrition schools? No, right. Alex, I don't. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. This is really overwhelming to me. Who am I supposed to believe? I'm sorry, but when did you, when did you get your MD? I don't remember when that happened. And you know, these people are telling me one thing. And so this is the confusion mm -hmm. is that you have people who are giving or talking about this information. And if we don't have some uh, standard, like Western medical degree, it's like some people just refuse, they don't wanna listen to that. Even though those people we know, a lot of the information that they were taught in school is bad. Also, you can talk, you have spoken to like how much nutrition training did you get None. in med school? You don't get any. None. And so that's the, the hard part. And um, when my dad, was in the hospital for his brain tumor. He's addicted to pop. I'm from the Midwest, so I say pop. Soda. Yep. <laughs> and uh, so he's addicted to pop and um, was having the nurses bring him his orange Fantas over and over and over again. And the night before surgery, I pulled the nurse aside and I said, hey, do you think maybe the night before surgery he should be having water? And she said, oh, you know, Miss Clark, that's probably a good idea. Rather than orange Fanta. Yeah. Right. And so... Uh, you know, after he leaves the next day after the surgery or a couple days later after the surgery, he's like begging us to go through the Chick-fil-A drive through He's begging us to take him to Pizza Hut. And I'm in tears. Like, Dad, please. Like, like you have been given an opportunity here. We were, they removed all the tumor. All of his MRIs have been clear uh, since removing the tumor in January, so, which is a miracle. Nothing has come back yet. But... He doesn't want to make any of these changes. And so I'm like, dad, you have, you have been given li literally a miracle window to make these changes. But, um, the hard part about being an adult and, you know, sometimes you start to learn things that your own parents don't know. And it's like a really weird, I'm sure you experienced this. It's a really weird position to start realizing like on some things you're, you just know more than your parents. Yeah, yeah and trying to explain that to them. And, and it's very hard for them to take that information from you because you are the child. You will always be seen as the child, as the baby. And so when you're telling them, stop doing this or change your life or change this behavior, it's very off-putting. Um, and so I've just had to try to tell myself, like, love him where he's at. If he decides to text me and say, okay, Alex, I'm ready to eat the way that you think I should eat or go see this doctor you think I should see, then I'd be so excited, but you know. It's just sad because, so we're in Los Angeles right now recording this podcast, and when I come to the States, I do content at some of the fast food places, right? So we went to Shake Shack yesterday, we went to Chick-fil-A the last time I was in the States, we went to McDonald's, and you look at the ingredients in these places. Shake Shack, Chicken Shack Sandwich has 80 ingredients, including all sorts of dough conditioners and preservatives. And silly putty. Yeah, you know, silly putty ingredients, dimethyl polysiloxane, like who knows what these things do in humans long term? Who knows? Who knows how much these could have contributed to your dad's cancer? Oh, I know. I 100% know that's what it is. It, it certainly 
seems to be like it, it could be a major problem. And we were talking before the podcast about brominated vegetable oil. And I was mentioning that it's in the Fanta orange soda. And it's also in uh, any of the citrus drinks. So it's in Squirt. It's in um, so many of these like Mountain Dew has a big one. It recently was outlawed in California. So it's illegal in California now. But the concern with brominated vegetable oil is that the bromine, along with the vegetable oil, which is obviously a seed oil, could potentially accumulate in the human body and compete with iodine at the level of the thyroid or cause neurologic issues. Mm. So it's just, it's so interesting that you're in the hospital, your father is going in for brain surgery and they are so myopic that they cannot understand the way that a Fanta orange soda might possibly have contributed to any one of his unfortunate metabolic abnormalities. Yeah, I mean, to me, I think it's mind blowing that in the places that we're sending sick people to get well, we're giving them things that make them sicker. Why, and even on their own hospital menu, soda is an option. Um, also, I mean, the food in hospitals in general, I was horrified by what his options were for dinner, every meal, it was, it was disgusting. And then, you know, the, they put McDonald's in all these children's hospitals. That is so deeply evil. It's evil. It's crazy. We're gonna give you this to make you sick, and then you know, magically, here's the the solution, and then we're gonna be there to nurse you back to health. It's like the whole thing is very insidious. One of the pieces of content that I did that got the most pushback was going to a children's hospital in Texas and going to their cafeteria. So, because they were like, "Don't. Why would you dog on this? Why would you bring attention? These people are just going through the worst time in their lives. Like, let them have what they want." Exactly. Yeah. It was such a dog pile. It yeah. was so crazy to me that people couldn't see this. No, this is juicy. I think you should do more of this content. I kind of want to because I've certainly gone to many hospitals that are adult hospitals and talked about cafeterias. I went to the University of Arizona hospital. That's where I went to medical school, and I went to the cafeteria in the hospital. They're all the same. You know, yeah. there's nothing surprising here. But I think it's. Illustrative. I went to the hospital at Mayo Clinic in Scottsdale, Arizona. They actually sent me a cease and desist letter and made me. <gasps> That's made, where I live. They made me take that video down because I didn't have permission to film in Mayo. So, um, but I'll tell you guys all. You guys all know the story. They use seed oils in the cooking, whether it's Mayo Clinic, you know, the pinnacle of health. I'm sure they use it in the Harvard cafeteria in Boston. They use it in the University of Arizona, and they use it at the Children's Hospital in Arizona. It's in Texas. It's no different anywhere. But it's just crazy to me that people can't understand the discordance here and the fact that these hospitals are just using horrible ingredients were so backwards in medicine. And it was so surprising when I went to a children's hospital, which I thought would be the most poignant for people. I think it was a, a grieved father who just said, my child was dying of cancer and she would have eaten anything. And people just piled on. And I said, I get it, but don't you understand mm -hmm. that perhaps these foods contributed to her cancer? Mm. And that was just, anyway, it's a crazy thing. People like, are like, you you went too far. But like, that's the thing. Like, I'm sorry, but we need, we need people that are willing to go far to get the point across. Like, how are people ever supposed to listen if you if we don't say things like that? Yeah. Like, we can't tiptoe around this. We're, I'm sorry, but we're not at a place in this country with our health right now where we can tiptoe. Now, maybe if we if you would have been doing that in the 80s, 90s, it would have been like, mm, a little too far too soon. But like, now, I'm sorry, but that like that ship has sailed. Like, we needed that a while back. So you doing that now, I don't think it's controversial at all. I think we need more of it. I think I'll probably repost it. Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Good, I hope I encourage you. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Also want to pause the podcast for just one more minute to tell you about another sponsor of this podcast. Heart and Soil is another company that I found that I'm super proud of what we do there. Beef liver is an incredibly nutritious thing to get in your diet, but very few of us actually want to eat beef liver. I took a bite out of this this morning um, and I feel great, but getting a convenient way to eat liver is incredible. And so Heart and Soil is a company that I built about four years ago and we make the finest grass-fed, grass-finished, desiccated, that is freeze-dried organ supplements on the market. They're capsules, it's always packaged in glass. There is no plastic in our packaging because microplastics are BS. Let me read you a review for Pure American Liver, which is an American-based, regeneratively raised liver capsule supplement that we make. Simply delicious, five stars. I want to like eating liver and have tried a few times, but I can't. I was thrilled when I saw my favorite supplement company made pure American liver. I'm 60 years old, physically active, and I feel like I have more energy than I ever have. I love that I can just pop the supplements into my mouth and I can tolerate it. Highly recommend it for optimum health. You won't regret it, says Maria. So check us out at heartandsoil.co, that's .co. 
If you need more organs in your life, but you're having trouble actually finding the organs or cooking the organs or don't really like the taste, this will completely change your world. In addition to liver, two of our most popular supplements are Whole Package, which has desiccated testicle and really helps males with hormonal issues, and Her Package, which is being raved about by the female community. It is a woman-centric supplement and contains uterus, ovaries, and fallopian tubes. You can find all of our desiccated organ supplements at heartandsoil.co. I'll put a link here in the frame. And Heart and Soil recently released a protein powder, which is a really high quality, low temperature processed grass-fed whey protein with colostrum and collagens. So definitely check out the Heart and Soil protein while you are there as well. Back to the podcast. So I wanna shift the podcast a little bit because I have the unique opportunity to talk to a millennial woman and a lot of my audience is men. So I would like to ask you, what do women want? And how does a man, a lot of my, I think my audience is probably a lot of 25 to 45 year old men. So maybe a little bit older than, than the women that you um, have in your audience. But in general, like what should men be thinking about when they are trying to meet a good woman? How does a man attract a good woman? Let's start there. Well, number one, I think the secret to any relationship success is understanding a woman's cycle. I think if you understand the different phases of a woman's cycle, okay. you you right there, you understand women because we are four different people throughout the month. Um, sometimes we're more creative. Sometimes we are going to be more moody. Sometimes we're going to handle stress worse than others. Uh, sometimes we're going to be really motivated to go out and be social. And other times we really do want to just like stay home and watch a movie. And if you understand her cycle and where she's at, that, you could suggest a different date. You know, you might suggest one date versus another that's really going to get her excited about you. Like, oh my gosh, like he just gets me. Like really, you just understand a woman's cycle, but she's going to think you get her. So does that mean before I go on a first date with a woman, I need to ask her when her last period, <laughs> like, where are you in your cycle right now? That's kind of a personal. <laughs> Maybe not that, but I think you I think on the first date, you absolutely could say something like, like what I just said, like, you know, I really think that the key to happiness in a relationship is, is a guy understanding a woman's cycle. Like, have you ever thought about that? And then she's either going to say, um, like, oh my gosh, yes, like absolutely. And if she's like, no, what do you mean? Then she like, she doesn't know anything. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to break it down for my male audience briefly? So that, you know, like the 30 day cycle, like what are the phases and how could they navigate this? Oh my gosh. Do I don't know like that a, I'm, do we I, need like a, a, an index card? Do we need like a cheat I sheet? know. I think I, I need to, to make sure I get everything, but the, basically, I mean, so, so I did, I will say this, I will say this. You should listen to this episode I did with this girl, Little Ray of Health okay. on Culture Apothecary. And we go so in depth, all four phases and just like, okay, this is when um, cycle begins, this is when it ends, and then during this week, she's gonna be like this, these are the types of food she's going to want, these are the types of things to avoid. During this week, these activities, avoid these foods, and she goes through every single thing, and I would say she is really good at like breaking that down to understand okay. for anybody, even a child like can listen to that, but that's one of my most popular episodes ever. It's, it's dating advice, guys, listen to this. I mean, I'll just, I'll try broadly to give people some, piece here. So you have, you have the menstrual period, right? Which is the first day that a woman is bleeding. We call that day one of her cycle. And then, you know, women will probably bleed for four to five days, who knows? And so by day five, they're stopping the bleeding, perhaps. Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yep. Yep. Yeah, yep. And so generally in medicine, if things are normal. Yeah. yeah. Things and then are if you know, if she's telling you like, oh my gosh, I've had my period for nine days, then like there's something going on. And then you can say to her, we have to get something checked out. Right. And so after a woman stops bleeding, you enter the follicular phase. Of, and this is the beginning when sort of the, the, the egg is in the ovaries getting ready to be ovulated. And my sense of this, and I could be completely wrong, is that in the follicular phase, women are sort of like energetic and a little bit outgoing. They were going to the gym, they feel okay. And again, correct me if I'm completely wrong. And then around day 14, and men need to know this so that they can talk to the women about family planning. Around day 14, they're going to ovulate. In fact, many women will ovulate on day 14. So if you're thinking about having sex with a woman and you don't want to use protection or you are thinking about- Yeah, avoid sex, those days. Right? You have to be careful around the 14th day of the cycle. So you need to know the first day the woman is having her menstrual period because 14 days from that is when she's ovulating. And, and guys are like, well, how the hell am I supposed to know all that? So if you're, and, and yeah, you're you're not probably going to figure that out on, on a couple dates, but if you are in a serious relationship right. with her- So, so we, now we're further down the relationship yeah, continuum. And when you're, when you're further down is you can say to her, if you're in a committed relationship, she is definitely probably tracking- uh, 
uh, her cycle on an app. And these apps now can make it so you can share your cycle with a partner. So your man can literally check and be like, okay, where's she at today? What's going on with her mood or whatever? And the app tells you she's going to be really emotional today. She's going to be, she's going to be super, uh, she's going to be wanting to have sex. She's ovulating. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then like, look, like, and those days where you know she's ovulating, like you can, you can really do, you could probably get her to do anything you want. (laughs) So take advantage of it, Yeah, you know? And I think there has been more discussion about this. I don't think men think about this as much as women, but there are traditionally, again, this is not medical advice. You'll get your woman pregnant if you're not careful. Like those days around the 14th day of the cycle are when a woman can get pregnant. And canonically, we are taught as physicians that it's generally in front of the ovulation that women are more fertile. Once a woman has ovulated, a day or two after maybe, but once the egg is actually into the fallopian tubes, it's less likely that a woman's gonna get pregnant. A woman is very likely to get pregnant in the days leading up to her ovulation. So three or four days before her ovulatory day, she's gonna be more uh, horny, she's gonna wanna have more sex, and that's when she could potentially get more pregnant. And then after someone ovulates, you enter this luteal phase, the mood starts to change potentially there. I think traditionally this is when women kinda wanna cluster in. So I think, so because of understanding how a woman's cycle works, this is why I think this is gonna be controversial and they're gonna be like, of course the conservative girl is saying this, but just hear me out. (laughs) Because we know how a woman works biologically, you have to admit that maybe a nine to five traditionally for a woman is not ideal because that is a incredible amount of stress to ask us to work that hard, be under those, that amount of stress, you know, throughout any course of a month, when we know that we have times we're going to be more creative, yeah. when we're going to handle stress better versus others. So um, I think that has contributed to a, a large amount of the uh, decline emotionally for women, stress, anxiety, depression, I, I think is just like this girl boss mentality. Right. Um, I think a lot of this has contributed to just like our overall decline in happiness uh, because women were just not meant. We were just not built. I'm not saying that there are not exceptions and there are some women that be like, I thrive, I love like I'm, I'm like this you know lawyer prosecutor and like I love my work I'm there of course but I'm just saying like overall biologically we weren't meant to work like men shocker men and women are different so we just handle these things differently so I don't know hot take for me but I think it's you know completely reasonable yeah so okay we've, we've got men who have homework to do on women's menstrual cycles what about what can a man do for themselves to make themselves more valuable to a woman? Like how can a man increase his value to a woman? How can we make ourselves more attractive to a woman? What comes to mind? I mean, for me personally, it's going to be, um, faith walk, um, like pursuing a relationship with God. That's going to be important to me. Okay. Um, but I mean, do you want to know for me or like just overall, I guess overall for For you and your sort of Millennial women audience, like what is the collective wisdom? That's a big thing for me. So my other hot take is I think it's incredibly unattractive for guys who toe the middle line politically and they're like, I'm a moderate. Okay. Um, I would rather date a staunch Democrat leftist than a moderate as a conservative woman because I think at least on one side or the other, like he knows what he believes and he's like willing to stand for something. And the guys that are in the middle, I just feel like it just gives apathy to me. Um, and I'm like, I, I, I think it's attractive for a man to have a strong opinion on something like that. Uh, so that's one thing on dating apps or whatever. If I see moderate, I'm like, no, wow, um, okay. not into it. So yeah, that's a hot take for me. And then I, I mean, obviously like a guy that's willing to take care of his health, like a guy that that does care about what he's eating. Um, if I'm like, what are you up to? And he's like, oh, I just, I just ran through Taco Bell. I'm like, absolutely not. Like we're not gonna be compatible. Um, and then I would say, Thinking about things like, if for you as a man, some guys are just dating and they're like, you know, I never see, I don't see marriage in the cards for me. Like, that's not what I want. That's fine. I'm not talking about you. But for guys that do eventually know that they want to have a family one day and a wife, I would say be finding out everything you can now in your season of singleness about what it takes to have a healthy marriage and in parenting, like read parenting books and things like that. I think 
because you don't want to wait till your wife is nine months pregnant to be like, oh, I guess I should like start looking into like what they're putting in baby formula and, and, and you know, baby food and things like that. Um, because we want you to lead as, uh, as the husband, we want you to lead our family. So, so how are you preparing now to be able to do that? I don't like, it is so unattractive to me as somebody that's working in the space when I am talking to a guy and I know more than him about all this health stuff and like, you know, he's like, what's a seed oil, whatever. I'm like, I can't like, <laughs> I need to be with a guy that knows more than me um, because I want to be led as a woman. That's natural too. This is natural. Even the girls, even like the ultra feminist girls that they're interviewing on the street outside of the bars that, you know, are like, oh no, I'm totally a feminist, whatever. They crumble at the sign of a guy leading. We love it. It's in our nature. So uh, a guy being like, we're going here for dinner. We're doing this. I think you should wear this. Um, don't make plans on this day. We're like, okay, say when. Like we love that. So I don't care what women say. Um, um, there's a reason why you you see so many self-proclaimed liberal women being like, I can't help it, like, I'm so attracted to conservative men. <laughs> like, because not, usually it's the conservative men that are going to be more, like, inclined to be leaders, whatever, and then you have these liberal, like, soy boy guys, literally, um, who are v vegans, you know, eating that way. And then I think, I don't think it's a coincidence that we have these vegan soy liberal guys who are also incapable of, like, taking charge and, and leading. I think all of that in masculinity is connected. So I'm hearing masculine themes. I'm hearing boldness. I'm hearing be the alpha as much yeah, as you can, so like lead. We, we need more masculine men. So so toxic masculinity is ridiculous. I I want more toxic masculinity. Okay, okay I mean, I'm, I'm being funny on that because I don't think masculinity is toxic at right. all. Um, I think that we have more cases of toxic femininity in in American culture today than we do masculinity. Uh, I think women are able to get away with a lot more. I think men. I think men are are, are having unbelievable amounts of trouble emotionally. Um, you're, you're seeing women are graduating from college more often. I mean, we're, we're just outperforming the men in every way. We're out earning men. So the wage gap stuff wow. is ridiculous. We're, we're out earning men. Like we really have it made as women in America and that's gonna be controversial with women. But the to, to men, I would just say like leaning into your true masculine. Um, and I think it's important, like you're not gonna be able to do that if you're not surrounding yourself with older men and mentors who can, who can kind of shepherd you in that way. So um, that's something I always like to ask a guy. And you could take this in a faith-based way or you could, or otherwise health or whatever, but I would be like, who is discipling you in your life as a man? Mm -hmm. who, who is mentoring you? Who yeah. is shepherding you and leading you in these things? Um, I think that's really important for guys to have other men in their life to do that. I think there are so many ways that in 2024, we forget where we've come from as humans. Yeah. In terms of what foods we should be eating, in terms of how we should be living our lives. And I think in terms of gender roles, for lack of a better term, and how we should behave around the opposite sex. Like think about where we've come from. This all makes so much sense. Who is the alpha in the tribe? The man that just gets shit done. Like take the lead, do not be passive. You know, go out, ask the girl, talk to the girl, make yourself better, make yourself stronger. You have to be able to protect her and lead her. My sense of this as a man is that women want men who can protect them. They want to, like this idea that a man is supposed to provide for a woman is so accurate. Like you should do that. That is your role as a man. You should show her that you can protect her and lead her. That's what we've done in tribes for hundreds of thousands of years. Why is this surprising to us? Because we've been so confused by all of these gender politics and strange things that are happening in our culture. Like there's nothing yeah. wrong with that. I, I think that's just Be the, moral, the alpha. That's the moral of the story for everything. When it comes to our food, when it comes to our relationships, when it comes to how we raise families, like let's just get back to basics. Like historically, let's just look back in cultures around the world, like what has worked and what hasn't. Um, and I think get back to that. Yeah. I saw something the other day that I thought was interesting. I wonder if you agree with this. It was a woman saying that men over index for appearance in women and women over index for status or money in men? I think that that's probably true, but I think that come, okay. I do, I think that's true, but I think that is coming back to the provider protector sense. Yeah. But here's the thing, we're talking about modern culture. So back in the day, what would that have looked like for women? Historically, caveman times or whatever, it was like, okay, can you, can you go out and, and, and hunt you know, our dinner to have for tonight? Today, it, it's providing and, and it's, it's having that stability. So um, guys get caught up in like, oh, she doesn't want me because I'm sorry, I only make $65,000 a year. She has to have six figures. I don't think there are gonna be some you know, 22 year old women that answer this incorrectly. My 
reason for like, I want a successful man. And yes, I, I think I would prefer to be with a man that makes a certain amount of money um, is not for like material reasons. It's, are you going to be able to take care of me so that I can be a stay at home mom right. one day? Yes. I want that option. I want that option. I do so many cool things and I love my job, but I want the option to completely quit this and stay home or dial it way back and not have to worry about being the main breadwinner. And I think secretly, internally, that is really how all women feel. So when we're asking you things like, well, how much money do you make? Or I need to be with a man that makes a certain amount. I think that just comes to, if he's making a certain amount, we know he can provide because it just looks different in today's age. It's just, you know, money, monetary sense of how he's protecting and providing versus like going out and literally hunting. Now, some guys are doing that, which I think is fantastic. And I love that. And that's super attractive to me. But, um, you know, most of us are getting food at the grocery store now, et cetera. So I think that's where that comes from. Do you think most of the women in your in your audience want the same? They actually want to be stay-at-home moms long-term? Oh, I think I think most absolutely. women do. All of them. Uh, one of my best-selling merch items was a sweatshirt that said stay-at-home mom university. So it was like either you're an alumni because you are a stay-at-home mom or you want to be one day. And uh, that was like one of my best-selling items. So yeah, it's a, it's a mixed bag. So the younger end of my audience that aren't married with kids yet, that's definitely their goal. And then the ones that are, like most of them are living that life. That's so interesting. I think that's powerful for men to understand that if- Oh, we're out here. We're out here for sure. Um, it's just like, where are you going? You know, find us. We're at turning point conferences, <laughs> uh, churches. I mean, okay, this is a great question. Yeah. Where can a man meet- I mean, that's it. You know, I, I think definitely the church is number one priority. Um, but also going to these like conservative events and things, you're definitely going to find some. Is it a good place to meet women? Yeah. Really? Yep. A lot of us. Okay. Interesting. And you can imagine that if you're at a conservative event, You've got one coming up in December, right? Yes, AM Fest, which is Turning Point USA's biggest event that we do every year. I mean, the top speakers, former President Trump has been known to show up, so you never know. Um, and then we also do concerts at night. So it's kind of like, I call it conservative Coachella. <laughs> it's just like hu huge. I mean, we're talking to like 13 plus thousand people. Now it's right. an election year, so I'm sure it's gonna be even bigger. Right. And um, massive podcasters, influencers, commentators, just some of the greatest minds in American politics speaking at the same conference. And it's it's for men, women, all ages, you know, some people bring their kids, it's for everybody. And you can imagine at a place like that, the women you meet, the single women you might meet as a man would really want to be stay at home moms. They're going to, yes. all of these things we're talking about, they're going to want you to lead. They're going to want you to show them that you can provide for them. And once you do those things, and this is going to sound so woo. So I apologize to my whole audience for this. They can be in their feminine as you are in your masculine. That's a real thing. Okay, so that's another thing is that guys <clears throat> complain. They say that women are not fem like truly feminine anymore. And my argument to that is, are you truly masculine? Because we will naturally go into our feminine when you are really in your masculine. We will naturally submit to that. That's what I was talking about is that we like crumble and we we want that leader. So we will naturally submit in that in that type of a situation. And so we've talked about this, but let's just emphasize this for the men listening. Like, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean for you when you see a masculine man? How does a man, like, demonstrate that to a woman and access all of this evolutionary program that just gets her to like him okay, so, <laughs> in a special way or surrender? Okay, so I'll give this example. So I'm talking to somebody, and my audience doesn't know this, so I'm saying this for the, for okay. the first time. So I'm talking to somebody and we're making plans, you know, there's like a date coming up or whatever. We're making plans and he tells me like, okay, I've got this taken care of. I'll, I'll be doing this. I'll pick you up at this time. I'll get you from the airport. You know, he's like doing all this. Um, and I go, I love that I can just turn my brain off. That is the most attractive thing to a woman when we can just turn our brains off and like take our hands off the wheel and know like every little piece you guys are taking care of. Like I didn't have to look up any restaurants. I didn't have to figure out my flight, I, like nothing. Like it was just like, okay, I got this. You're going to do this. You're going to go here, do this. I'll get you. Then we'll do this. Like made the whole plan. And I was like, amazing. I love it. And, and that's really, it. it's just taking initiative. It's, it's going up to her. Um, I, I, I love this story because it's, it's really shocking in today's culture, but I think it's really interesting. So Charlie Kirk, who's my boss, founder mm -hmm. of Turning Point USA, when he met his wife, Erica, he, at first people were telling him like, hey, we know this girl. We think that you should take her to dinner and, and maybe see if she should be an employee of ours. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it was like kind of like that. It was like a business dinner thing, but he took her out and immediately after talking for a couple hours, he's like, no, like this is who I want to be my wife. So in the dinner, she's like, uh, so did I get the job? And he said, no, you didn't get the job. And she's like, oh, and she's like really taken aback. And, um, she, he goes, no, um, I'm going to date you. And she was like, 
okay. Like there was no question. It was, I'm going to date you. Um, and it was because he like just took that initiative and just said it like that. It wasn't asking or whatever. He just said it. And she was like, Ab okay, absolutely. And they were dating and then now they're married and they have two kids. Um, and they tell the story better than me, but, uh, it's, it, I love that story because Charlie just like took charge and did that. And I think Erica's reaction, which was kind of like shocked, but also into it. I think that's how most women would react. Now, you are vibing, you have some social awareness to know like, is she into this conversation? Like, you know what I mean? You can't go up to a woman on the street, a stranger and be like, I'm dating you. That's not gonna go over well for you. In an elevator, you know, I'm dating you, no. But right, what I'm saying right. is like, they were at this dinner for several hours getting into like deep philosophical talks and and life goals and and you know po politics and whatever and so they had really gotten to know each other throughout this conversation where they were vibing and he was able to say that and her be receptive how does a man know that a woman is into him she and this could be on a date I, okay I, so there's two questions one of them is you're on a date with a woman and one of them which precedes that is you're in real life with a woman so if I'm in the grocery store or I'm on the beach or I'm somewhere, how do I know if a woman is attracted to me or into me? And then if I'm on a date with a woman, how do I know that it's going well? Well, one, I think she's staying there talking to you. She's not trying to get away. So like if a man comes up to me in public and starts talking to me and I am not interested, I'm not attracted, like I'm immediately finding a way to get out of this conversation. Like, I'm, oh, that's so great. Like, so cool. Okay, well, I, you know. You I'm can feel it. Yeah, you can feel it. Like we are, there is a mentality of us like trying to escape. Um, but sometimes like we'll linger and then like try to keep the conversation on. So uh, when I started talking to this guy that I'm talking to, he had, uh, it was, he reached out on Instagram DM, which has never happened. And, and I have been a public figure since I was 18 years old. I started very, very young. I've never had like an attractive guy or someone I'd be interested in, in DM me. Okay. And he was not flirty. He was like very professional. Just like, I saw this, something I had done, a video I had done. And he was like, you know, keep up the good work. Like I fully agree with what you had said. Okay. And then I looked at his page. I saw we had a lot in common and all these things. And so we started talking and, um, I did everything I could in that conversation to like ask an additional question. Like, I want this conversation to keep going. And eventually he was like, you know, I'd much rather uh, take this off DMs. Like, can I get your number? Texted me, texted me like two times and then immediately said like, uh, when can I call you tonight? And I said like, I was filming, I was doing a bunch of stuff. And I said, I have a 30 minute window. And he said, I'll take any 30 minutes I can get. Called me exactly. And we talked for those 30 minutes. Wow. Okay. And then going forward, it was like, talk for three hours, talk for five hours. So, um, you know, I was working with like trying to keep like talking to him and then he also took initiative to be like I will call you doing things like that even like offering to call her um versus just text or dm really stands out I think a lot of women find that attractive and not a lot of guys are willing to do that but I love you I think you might have said that in our interview on my show did you say that you you call a woman for a first date yeah so like I love that that's something that I really really love and he did that so like offering to just be like I'm just gonna call you I think you get a lot of chemistry and like I think that also helps disarm things like nerves and things going into the first date you've heard each other's voice you've talked um you can ask a couple questions to be like you know is this does this first date is it going to have potential right like you can get a lot out of the way if you just talk agree. for 15 minutes yes yeah so I recommend everybody talk on the phone before going on the first date yeah. I, I love that what about so this is an interesting thing that I want to ask you about so what about like in public before a man has even approached a woman how does a man know that it's okay to approach a woman? So we're backing up, right? Because the first thing we talked about was like, okay, when you're already in the conversation with a woman, she's going to show you that she's interested. She's going to stay in the conversation. You can tell. I think you what about don't the know. Approach? I think you don't know and you just take the chance. It's part chance. of being a man. Like if I'm at the grocery store, I'm putting stuff into my basket or not paying attention okay. and then you come up, like find a good reason. Ask me, see something in my basket and be like, oh my gosh, I see this beef tallow brand. Well, have you tried lineage? It's 10 times better. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so like you got to, you got to like figure out some natural way to start a conversation. Like don't come up and be like, I'd like to take you out for coffee or don't be weird. Um, find a way to be natural, strike up conversation. Like I said, that's then it's up to her to either try to get out of that conversation or, or stick around. And a woman isn't going to be offended if, if someone approaches them in public? No, if you're just friendly and you're you're coming up with something to say like that, like, oh, I love what you're you're buying at the store. You're, you're no, you, she's at a bookstore and she's checking out a book. Like, oh, I haven't read that one. Have you read this? Like, there's just natural ways to just be friendly and then see what happens.
How much does the eye contact happen before you approach, before a man approaches a woman? Like how likely are you to make eye contact with a man before he approaches you? I think you only need one time. And honestly, if I'm not paying attention to the store or whatever, and you came up to me, like if I look, if I turn and look at you and this is the first time I'm seeing you and like, you're cute. And I'm like, Ooh, you know, then I'm going to stick around. I don't think you have to wait. Like we didn't make eye contact three times. So I couldn't right. approach. Like, right. I don't think you need to, to worry about that. What is, so this is the question I have in this. I'm asking for a friend here. I'm just curious as a man, <laughs> like for me actually, like, so I'm in the grocery store. I make eye contact with a woman. Is it going to be different if she's open and willing to like, talk to me? Is she going to give me a signal if I make eye contact with her? No. No. You don't think we're so? We're just looking. Like, we, we're just, we're like, we're just like uh, operating out of space and time. Like, we're just women. We're like, okay, that, I don't know. We don't even clock it. What we don't you, even think about it like what that. What if you make eye contact with a guy that you think is attractive in the grocery store? Is it going to stay longer? Are you going to smile at him? Well, maybe. There I might have a be a little of that. about this. Yeah. 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 There might be a little bit of that. Um, but for me, so I get so nervous whenever I like see uh -huh. a guy that I think is cute that like I'll avoid eye contact because I'm like, I'm like, oh my gosh, he's so cute. And I, I can't even like handle it. So okay. then I would need him to come up to me, like come up with an excuse. This is super valuable. Thank yeah. you. So like sometimes guys, you have to just be willing to go. I mean, that's the moral of the story. It's like, it's brave season for dudes. Like you guys, that's the whole thing is like men are not supposed to be averse to risk. Like that's right. more of a woman. So don't put it on us I love that. to try to make a risk and take a chance and like, and, and potentially face rejection. Like that should really be up to you guys. Okay. That's so interesting. That's so valuable. Thank you for all of that. Because I think it's so interesting as a man, we don't get those classes. In, I know, you know. Right. Yeah. We don't get those classes in like elementary school, you know? I don't know how many dads in the world are talking to their sons or daughters and saying, or moms, you know, I think that maybe parents should talk to their kids and say, this is how you meet a girl, or this is how you should, this is how you could talk to a guy, or this is how you could attract a good man. You're like, this is super important. And I don't know how often this is being talked about. So that's super valuable. It's really interesting. And I think it makes so much sense evolutionarily. And just this idea, like be brave, just go out there. And it's a whole different world when you're on dating apps. I think that changes everything, unfortunately. Like men listening to this, what I would say to you, um, is that in real life is the way to do it. Uh, 100% agree. We but, hate being on those apps. Yeah, women don't like it. But I mean, you met this guy that you're talking to on Instagram. So it doesn't Enough. have to be in real life. I mean, I think that there are so many things that really play into compatibility today that it's hard sometimes to meet people in real life that are aligned in terms of all the values. It's really hard. And that's why I think it's important to meet over like a centered activity or interest. So whether that is church or whether it is like a run club or, um, you know, your local Weston A. Price chapter or right, something like right. th there are different things like that. Like that's where I would go um, because you, you got to like have something like that, that you can have a common interest that you're bonding over. So last question about this. In terms of the first date, does a woman care what the first date is or does the man just have to take the lead on it? Does a woman... No. The, everybody is overanalyzing the first date. You do not need to do a $250 dinner for the first date. It could seriously be ice cream. It could be ice cream. It could be not even anything. It could be meet me in the park. Let's go. Let's. You have a dog. I have a dog. Let's take our dogs for a walk. It could be nothing. Um... I actually think a first date should be basically nothing, barely any money spent because you are trying to figure out why would you spend a whole bunch of money to, for it to be like waste? I think you just do something together, like be around each other for a little bit, plan for an, for an hour. If it's going well, you know, you can drag it out longer. That's the thing. If you meet somewhere early enough where it's like a neutral place and it's going really well and then dinner time's approaching, then you could say like, hey, do you want to like go to this spot? Right. You could always do that. Right. So if you plan your date early enough, like that is is nice. But um, And then if it's not good it's and it's only one drink or one cup of coffee then you can be like hey you know I'm so sorry I have to work tomorrow or whatever but it was so nice to meet you and then leave so I love the idea of like bare minimum just drinks just ice cream for a first date this is so interesting I've never talked about any of that on my podcast so Yay! <laughs> yeah, yeah hopefully my audience will find that valuable I think my audience like we talked about before the podcast is is a lot of men. It's majority men, but just slightly majority men. And hopefully even the women will find all of that valuable. So thank you for coming on the podcast. We talked about health and activism and dating and stuff. Um, very unique episode. Appreciated getting to meet you. Thank you so much for all the work you're doing. I'm excited to see what happens at Kellogg's. Thank you. Where can people find what you're doing and follow all of this stuff that's happening in your world? Yeah. So you can subscribe.
subscribe to Culture Apothecary. That's my podcast. Anywhere you get your podcast, any platform. And then Real Alex Clark on YouTube is where you can watch my podcast. Mm -hmm. So uh, any of those places. And then I'm on Instagram at Real Alex Clark. And then we talked about this. It's AmFest. Yes, AmFest.com. If you want to get tickets to our biggest conservative conference, it's it's in Phoenix. It's uh, the week before Christmas. Okay. So it's kind of, it's right in that holiday time. I know, but um, it's a beautiful time of the year to come to Phoenix. It, it's perfect weather to escape the winter if you're in a winter spot. You'll Makes have to leave sense. your sloths. Yeah, yeah. And I might be there. I'll <laughs> let you guys know if I'm there. I may come, and maybe I'll talk. Who We'd knows? Love we'll it. see. We'd love it. We'll see. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Mm -hmm.